All right, church, here we are, 20, uh, 19th of September, 2021. And the topic today will be the book of Acts. So um, we're going to have a bit of a, a look into what the early church experienced, how God worked with them, what they taught, and how they received the Holy Spirit, how they got baptized, and um, some of the other events of the book of Acts. Uh, in fact, we'll be going into a little bit more of book of Acts next week as well. But um, when you read the book of Acts, what you need to realize is that the people that God used with all these miracles and mighty ways, they were ordinary, everyday people just like us, but they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. And the Bible does tell us that we will receive power when we receive the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to open it up a bit. So if, you, if you're new to this topic or you want to know more about the Holy Spirit, about baptism, and about what the early church taught, then today is a good day to um, get your ears open and open your eyes to what we're, we're going to talk about. So, John, can I get you to read Acts 1, verse 8, please? Just had to find my mute button. Okay. Uh -huh. Acts 1, chapter 8. But you shall receive the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and to all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. All right, great. Thank you. All right, so after Jesus had died on the cross and he resurrected from the dead, he then appeared to the disciples and on a number of occasions over a 50-day period, and they were told that they were to wait for the promise of this Holy Spirit to come. Now, remember, they'd been walking with him for three years. They'd seen all the miracles. They'd even been used by God in mighty ways prior to this. They'd seen him. Now they'd seen him resurrected. But he was still telling them that, that there was a, um, a blessing that would come, and that would be being filled with or having an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Some people use that, tech, that term as well. And the reason that they were going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons was that they would be able to be witnessing to him in a powerful way of his teachings, of his life, his death, his resurrection and the gospel. And the book of Acts is a record of what, how the church began and what God did through his Holy Spirit in them. And um, today we're going to get into it a little bit to understand or to make it known that what happened on this day 2000 years ago is still the same today for the church today we can still experience these things and um, it's important for us to go back to our beginnings and back to our roots if you want to find out about an organization or uh, a nation uh, you have to go back to the beginnings to find out the, the truth about where they come from, about their people, about their culture, about their beliefs. And it's the same of the church of Jesus Christ. Um, some people, when they look at church history, they only go back to the Reformation, which we all agree that the Reformation was from God. Um, but we need, we need to go, some people go back to uh, the, the 325 AD when they were, had that Nicene Council. But we need to go back to the first century church, to the beginning of the church, and that's where it began the Gospels and the Book of Acts and then the letters that were written to the New Testament church. So today we're going back to when the church began. So if I can get um, Kian to read out Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 30, please. Yep, it says here, And afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. All right, thank you. All right, so what Keen's just read out there was a from the prophet Joel, this is hundreds of years before Jesus was born and before the day of Pentecost 
that we are now going to be having a look at when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. Um, but it was a prophecy that God was going to pour out his spirit in a miraculous way, in a powerful way, and it was going to be upon all flesh. It was going to be upon all people. Um, and before in the Old Testament, God would put his spirit on certain prophets and individuals, but the average person didn't have the spirit come on them in the same way. Now, in the New Testament, which is a better promise, a better covenant, a better ministry um, uh, from, from God, he is promising to pour out his spirit upon all of his people. And this is from a couple of hundred years before Jesus was born or several hundred years before he was born. But God was already preparing them to know that a time was coming when the Holy Spirit and the power of God is going to be poured out. And this happened on the day of Pentecost um, in, in the book of Acts and after the Jesus' resurrection. Now, Pentecost means 50 days. So this was 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, after the, Pas or sorry, after the Passover, which was when Jesus was crucified. And then this Holy Spirit was poured out, as we're going to get into. And it didn't just happen 2,000 years ago. It didn't just happen 1,000 years ago or even 500 years ago. It's still happening to this day. And in 1906, somewhere around there, there was this Azusa Street uh, revival in America that spread out through the world when people started to uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit again just over 100 years ago. And um, I believe that God wants to fill his church with the Holy Spirit again. So we're going to look at that a little bit and see what God will teach us. Mary Ann, can you read out Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, please, when you're ready? Okay. Um, Acts chapter 2. Um, the Holy Spirit comes at the Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw that seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Thank you. All right, so they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The believers, were they were together praying. Uh, they were having a, some sort of, I guess, a prayer meeting, if you want to call it that. And every one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we know that they were filled with the Holy Spirit or because they were, um, they were in, this power of God came on them. But they also heard uh, the disciples, other people that were there heard it that they were speaking in languages that they'd never learned. It was a supernatural um, sign that they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, Jews from around the different nations there were present at this time, and they heard these people speaking in languages which they understood, and um, they were amazed at this particular situation. Um, but what... what uh, we can take from this is that when God sends his Holy Spirit, there's something miraculous happens. You know, like I, before I was a, um, when I was a young Christian and I first came to our church, there were some questions being asked by me uh, about the Holy Spirit. And I had some people from another church telling me differences of opinions about the baptism or the infilling or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And they didn't believe that it was for today. And God gave me a, a dream. And I don't really have dreams. But on this particular occasion, it was like God showed me. I went into a church, a traditional church, and people there were coming down the altar or the, to the altar to the archbishop. And the archbishop was praying for them to receive the Holy Spirit. And nothing was happening. None of them were receiving it. And I noticed that they were all wearing shirts with uh, like uh, worldly pictures on it and about, you know, bands like there was a band called ACDC, which was very uh, heavy metal stuff. And they were also sung a lot of songs about evil and, and the devil and stuff. 
And what God showed me was that these people in these traditional churches were living like the world. They hadn't changed. There'd been no real repentance, but they weren't being filled with the Holy Spirit either. And um, so what I had to do was I had to find out, well, what is the Holy Spirit? What's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What's the evidence for it? And, and it says here in verse 4 that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, or these supernatural languages. And um, so um, most Pentecostal churches that you will, will meet will teach you that the initial evidence or one of the signs of receiving the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. And um, uh, we're going to get into that uh, as we go along in this study. So uh, if I can ask you, Grace, to just read out Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through to, to 8. Oh, don't bother reading out verses 9 through to 11 because it's just got a lot of different nations. But, but that's all the different pe Jewish people from the different nations that had come there. So if you can read that out, please, Grace, go ahead. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, well, bewilderment, yeah, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Yeah, all right, and then he gives a list out of the next two or three verses of all the different uh, types of people that were there, Jewish people, but they that had been living in different countries. Now, what happened was when they heard them speaking in tongues, they were amazed because, if you, for, for instance, if I learned Tagalog, you will know that I'm not an, a Filipino uh, born, native born Filipino because I'd have a certain accent about me. But the, in this case, when they were speaking, it was perfectly uh, the right not only the right language, but the right accent and everything. And God was uh, using this baptism of the Holy Spirit to get the attention of the people that were there, all these different groups of people. And they were amazed because they knew that they were all from Galilee. And how, you know, and obviously that how would they have known our language? And what God was showing them was because they heard them praising God. They heard them speaking the wonders of God and prophesying in their own native languages, which they were familiar with. And um, it, this was the beginning of the church. This was the day that the church actually began. And this was the day when the church actually got first filled with the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And um, this is what we need to go back to. We need to go back to the first century church. We need to experience what they experienced in the 21st century because the message of Jesus has not changed. It's the same today as it was then. Um, so in Karen, when you're ready, I'm going to get you to read out Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 21. And what this portion of scripture is in Acts is what Kean read earlier from Joel. And Peter begins to explain what this speaking in tongues is. Karen, when you're ready, can you read out Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 21, please? Um, there we go. Acts chapter 2, 14 to 21. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, then Peter stood up with the other 11 apostles and in a loud voice began to speak to the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen to me. And let me tell you what this means. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. This is what I will do in the last days, God says. I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and your daughters will proclaim my message. Your young men will see visions and your old men will have dreams. Yes, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will proclaim my message. I will perform miracles in the sky above and wonders on the earth below. There will be blood, fire and thick smoke. The sun will be darkened and the moon will turn red as blood 
before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And then whoever calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. Thank you. Very good. All right. So what uh, Karen has Thanks, just read. Out. Oops. Yeah. What Karen has just read out there is the fulfillment of what Joel prophesied hundreds of years before. And it came true in the days of the apostles. And Peter is now explaining them. This is the Holy Spirit being poured out. This is what it's about. Um, some of them are thinking that they were drunk. Um, and he, he said, no, this is the Holy Spirit. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which the prophet Joel spoke about. And, and he, then, he, then what he did is began to preach to them. So um, AJ, if you can read out Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 24, and verse 36 when you're ready. And then after that, or more, I'd get you to read out Acts 2, 37 to 38. So, AJ, when you're ready, Acts chapter 2, verse 22, beginning there. Is it up to 22 to what? Uh, Acts 22 through to 24, and then verse 36 on its own, please. Okay. Um, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible, impossible for the death to keep its hold on him. Uh, 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. All right. Thank you. All right. So this Jesus is both Lord and Christ or Lord and Messiah. Um, Peter He's given the first church sermon here, or the first church message. The church has just been birthed. It's been filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Peter gets up and he's telling them, this is what Joel spoke about. And then he starts telling them about Jesus, how he, he died on the cross. And you, you guys were partly responsible for it. You, you, you were the ones who put him to death. But he was being risen from the dead. And... He begins to tell them that Jesus is Lord, he is Christ, he's Messiah. And he's beginning to tell them what, about what, what all this means and, and who Jesus is. And then he's going to lead him to tell them what they, they need to do. And so, um, Amor, if you can read out Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 38, please. Acts chapter 2, 37 to 38. When, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter then replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, thank you. All right, so he then explains to them because they, they ask him in verse 37 there, after he's told them about, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit fulfilled by Joel, Joel's prophecy fulfilled here. And Jesus is Lord. You have crucified him, but he rose from the dead. Then they ask him this question, what shall we do? And it's a relevant question for us today. Each one of us has to ask God, what shall we do? What do we do with Jesus? What do we do about the gospel? What do we do about um, what the Bible teaches? We all have to come to that place. We all have to God, what do you want? What do we do to be right with Jesus, to be saved, to be forgiven? Um, and what do we do to be filled with the Holy Spirit? These are all questions that we should still be asking today, and that the answers are still the same. And people are still asking these questions. So anyway, after he's teach them, taught them about Jesus as Messiah, his death and his resurrection, and that he then answers their question about what they should do, and he says this: first of all. You need to repent. Now, repent is not a word that we use a lot in the uh, everyday common uh, conversations today, but it basically means 
that we we tell God we're sorry for our sins. We have a change of heart and change of direction. And we stop doing things our way and we start doing it God's way. We humble ourselves before God. God, I'm sorry. God, cleanse me, change me, take away my sins. God, I, and, and then we make a decision that we're going to follow him and we're going to stop doing the things that we've been doing that are against God. And then he says that after doing that, that you should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or removal or forgiveness of your sins. And uh, this is what you'll find throughout the book of Acts. This was the message all the way through. So, you know, you don't get saved by going to church. You don't get saved by reciting the Lord's Prayer or saying the rosary or, or kissing the foot of St. Peter at the Vatican. Um, you don't get saved by praying to Mary. You don't get saved by pastoring. Uh, by shaking Pastor Steve's hand or becoming a member of Plumping Community Church. This is, this is what we need to do. We need to repent and then we need to be baptized in Jesus' name. And then he says, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. So they received it. And now he's telling people, this is what you need to do to receive the Holy Spirit. So uh, this is what the early church taught. We need to go back to the early church to find out what they taught so that we can follow what the Bible actually says on it. Our church traditions and denominations are not what we go back to. We have to go back to the Bible, back to the book of Acts in this case, about how the church started and how it baptized, how they received the Holy Spirit, when they received the Holy Spirit, when they baptized people, what people had to do before they were baptized, how you became a Christian, all this stuff, it's found in the book of Acts. And we have to go back there and then we follow what it's taught because you cannot improve on the original, all right? You've seen movies sometimes where they've made remakes of movies, classics that you would have maybe seen years ago and this is a great movie and then they make a, re, a, a, a renewal of that movie but it's nowhere near as good as the original. And it's the same with what happens in churches today, unfortunately, that instead of going back to the original, they make their own version of it, but they leave some of the some of the experiences or some of the teachings of the original church out of their uh, denomination or out of their experience. So, uh, yeah, someone's just put a comment there. Praise the Lord. Teaching repentance is lacking in so many churches these days, not ours. Right, thank you very much for that. Very good. So, yeah, so uh, this is part of the pattern. So before we go on, I'm going to ask uh, VJ if you can get ready to read out Acts 2, verse 41, and Dina, Hebrews 13 and 8, and then Paniotti, you're going to be reading out Acts 2, 39. So okay. uh, VJ, if you're ready, can you read out Acts 2, verse 41? Okay. On that day, about 3,000 believed his message and were baptized very good well done mate all right so what a day that would have been eh? what an amazing day what an amazing work three thousand people in one day were baptized after hearing peter speak after the holy spirit was poured out after he's told them what they need to do yeah. three thousand people responded to him and the church was off and running and throughout the book of Acts, you'll find many stories of miracles, conversions, people being filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, as I've wrote here in the notes, that uh, someone said, sent this to me on Facebook several years back, but the early church didn't have buildings like it does today. It had very few resources, didn't have a lot of money about it. Uh, it didn't have men in places of power, so there was no political connections. They were just humble people, uh, fishermen and, and uh, carpenters and, you know, ordinary day people. They weren't the powerful people of the, the generation that they lived in. But they turned the world upside down with the gospel because they had the power of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to bring his church back to the same thing there. Uh, it's back to the same experiences there. Um, so if I can ask Dina to read out Hebrews 13, 8, please.
Okay, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus the Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. The, the, the power that God had back then, the power of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the miracles have not changed. He's not changed. He, he wants to give us these experiences today. He wants to pour out his power on us today. He wants us to be baptized today. He wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. He wants us to repent today. And he wants to do like what he did on the day of Pentecost in people's lives and in churches today. He hasn't changed. He's still the same. Jesus is still the same. The gifts of the spirit that, um, that he gives to the church, they're still for today. Nothing's changed. And many churches, unfortunately, have forgotten or do not understand or have even rejected that uh, the Holy Spirit's for today and that the, the, the gifts are still for today. They, they, they don't believe it anymore. They say it's only for 2,000 years ago. It was only to get the church started, but they're no longer necessary or no longer available today. But it doesn't say that in the Bible, guys. It doesn't say that. In fact, uh, if I can get Paniotti read out Acts 2.39, and we'll find out what Peter actually said after this Holy Spirit experience. Okay. This promise is for you and your children. It is for everyone. Our Lord, our Lord God will choose no matter where they live. All right. Thank you. Did you hear that, guys? This promise is to you. Now he's talking to the people at the time that are standing before him, your children, so the next generation. And then he says, and to all, wherever you are, afar off, my version says, as many as the Lord our God will call. Has God called you? Is God still calling people today? This promise is still for today. The promise of the Holy Spirit, the promise of his power, the promise of his miracles, the promise of um, um you know, like the gifts of the spirit. It's still for today, guys. Nothing has changed. God hasn't changed anything. It's still for 2021. And we've got to hunger for it. We've got to search for it. We've got to hear about it. We've got to look for it. We've got to ask God, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit and start to hunger for it. And, and he will give you the Holy Spirit. Jessica, can I get you prepared to read Acts chapter 10? Verse 44 and 46. And then, Jerlyn, I want you to get prepared to read Acts 10, verse 47 to 48. So, Jessica, when you're ready, please read. Acts 11, verse 44. While Peter yet spake this word, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And the of the Sertrum Shun, which believe were as no. Astonished. Sorry about that. That's all good. Astonished. Came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They then answer Peter. All right. Thank you. All right. So we now see, we now see that the, the non Jewish people which is Gentiles, which is for us. Some people will say, oh, that was only for the Jews. Well, no, these are not Jewish people, but they've, they've been filled with the Holy Spirit. This is Peter. Peter had this vision to go to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. And uh, he went there and he went to this man's house uh, called Cornelius. And, and he told them the same thing as he told the Jews on the day of Pentecost about being filled with the Holy Spirit, about Jesus dying on the cross and, and who he was. And, and as he's tell, telling them that, the Holy Spirit came upon them and it says that they were magnifying God and they heard them speak with tongues. And then, you know, he, 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 he realized he was amazed. They were amazed that they were filled with the Holy Spirit because these weren't Jewish people. And the Jewish people, like Peter and others, the, the apostles, they would not have considered that the Gentiles would have been worthy of this gift. But God's plan was to go into all the world with the message of Jesus, with the New Testament covenant 
of Jesus dying on the cross and the resurrection and repentance and and being forgiven and, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, can I get you, um, Julian, to read out verse 47 and 48? Look at me. These Gentiles have been giving the Holy Spirit just as we have. I am certain that no one would dare stop us from baptizing them. Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked him to stay on a few, for a few days. All right. So in, after they received the Holy Spirit, he then baptized them and he baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord. Um, so the pattern's there. Sometimes people receive the Holy Spirit before they're baptized, but always a person will have repented and accepted Jesus as their savior before they receive the, the Holy Spirit. And that's, they should also have repented and receive Jesus as their savior before they are baptized. This is why we don't baptize children in our church. At least, I mean, if a child is old enough to repent and understand what baptism is about, then we will do it. If they've been filled with the Holy Spirit, we will do it. But usually children are too young to really understand what baptism is about. So the early church never baptized children. It always baptized a person after they committed their life and repented of their sins. But we see here that sometimes people receive the Holy Spirit, but then they still need to be baptized. It's not like, well, we've got the Holy Spirit now, no need for baptism. That's not what the Bible teaches. It says, Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a package. It's all part of the obedience to Christ. Um, I was, uh, we're going to read out Zechariah 4 verse 6. Jean, have you got that one there, please, when you're ready? I have. Zechariah 4 6. Uh, so he answered and said to me, This is the Lord, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, um, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. All right. So. It's not by our wisdom. It's not by working it up. It's not by our you know, charismatic natures. It's not by our, how smart we are. It's not about our background. It's not about our traditions. It, it's going to happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's God's spirit that does the work. It's he who does it. It's he who called us. It's he who saves us. Jesus does everything. The Holy Spirit is what empowers us. Uh -huh. We we are empowered by his spirit to be what he wants us to be. It's not our own efforts. And that's what we need to get back to church. It's not going to grow. The church is not going to grow by human efforts, but it will grow by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, I spoke a couple of weeks ago about a spring season coming. Well, God wants to bring us back into the fullness of the, of the gospel, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the message and the encounters with Christ and the, the gifts of the spirit so that we can then be used by him to take the message of Jesus to others. He wants his church filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants his church cleansed. All right, Josh, can you read out Acts chapter 9, please? We're coming to an end and we're going to go into our breakout rooms in a moment, guys. Acts chapter 9, verse 3 to 6, Josh, when you're ready. Yeah, I'm going to get it. Um, as he heard Dem Dem Demacus, Damascus Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, So, so, what, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? So asked. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. All right, thank you. Uh can you read it? Uh, yeah. All right. All good. You got that. All right. So we see that this is the conversion of Paul. All right. So he was a persecutor in the church. He was actually on the road to Damascus. He was going there to grab Christians and throw them in jail. And um, he was consenting to their death. He was their enemy. He really persecuted them. And um, he was 
going down there and then he has this encounter with Jesus Christ and you know, he sees this vision and, and he says to him, who are you, Lord? Now, the Jews only believe there's one God and one Lord, all right? There's no confusion here. So he's asking, who are you, God? And, and this is what Jesus, this is the answer he gets. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, you can imagine he must have been very fearful at that point because he realizes he's been going against God and hurting his people. He must have wondered what was God was going to do to him. But he then says to him, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then, you know, Jesus tells him to, what, to go to a certain place and he'll be told what to do. Now, Paul would go on to be a great missionary for God and spread the gospel around the, len, the then known world. He's actually responsible for 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. So this dramatic encounter he had with God shows us the power of God to change a person. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Paul's conversion next week in more detail. But I've just put this in here to let you know that no one is too far away from God to be able to re be wrought, uh, reached by God. And he can, if he can do this with Paul, he can do something with your life as well. And, um, you know, this is the power of the Holy Spirit. When the power, when someone encounters Christ, they're changed forever. And that's what he wants us to um, be changed forever when we encounter him so the, the last thing here is what can god do with you all right guys so um i'm just going to stop the sharing here and the recording